I would love to see something along the lines of like cold damage always slows your target. Fire damage always causes burning. Like I, I'd like to see a way that elemental damage could be implemented in a more unique fashion that has a bigger impact on the game. The way monster resistances and, and immunities and the way legendary resistance works needs to be rethought because as it currently is, it's a little too binary for my taste. If we could break the ties between you have to pick either a ASI or a feat, I would like to see more openness on the ability to just choose feats at certain levels. And we could just have a rule in there that says that characters get to pick a feat at level 2, level 6, level 12, and level 18 at the beginning of each tier of play or something like that. Like, just have an optional rule that if you want a game that has more feats, you can do it. Having a, an optional rule where feats are presented as something that characters can train for in their downtime or gain as an alternative reward would be really, really great at making feats a more interesting part of the game. As much as we get flack for being min-maxers and we're pretty tame as far as it comes to character optimization goes, I really don't think that the difference between the best option and the worst option should be that far. In an ideal world for me, it would be impossible to choose something that let you do more damage. It would never be a choice of what deals the most damage. It would always be a choice of what is interesting to you and the merits of how you build your character are not, you would not have the ability to take a feat that increases your damage because the damage level is something that is innate in the character. Um, so yes, well, I want there to be a little bit, I want there to be more character options. I want there to be lots of room for creativity. I still want to be able to have fun building my character. I want to make sure that fifth edition keeps to that general mentality of making sure that the gap between a character that's chosen the best options and someone who's just been choosing the flavorful options is pretty small. And so that play at the table is more important than, you know, picking the laundry list of you know, what the dungeon dude said the top five cantrips were. I'd much rather have a better system that actually advertises what I can expect as a dungeon master so that I can say, oh yes, this creature who is CR4 should go solo against my group of level four characters and it will make an interesting evening of combat. How the Lich, a challenge rating 21 monster, is not really good at delivering the epic final encounter that you would expect it to. And many people rightly so say, well, a lich should have minions and they should have traps and they should have all these adventure design conceits. And I agree, they should have all that. But then when it comes down to it, the lich should also be able to throw down. <laughs> and, and so that's the distinction to me here where monsters need, there's, there's something intimately satisfying about the toe-to-toe -to -toe showdown between the player characters and the final boss. And we need to make sure that monsters like the Lich, like dragons, like the Tarrasque, are able to deliver on that epic final boss fight without the dungeon master having to bog down that fight with minions that are just there to be cannon fodder, which is, a, in my books, it's a boring solution. It's, it's not... Yes, it works. It makes the combat more interesting in many ways, but sometimes you just want that final showdown. Dungeon Masters need tools in the rule books that work reliably so they can focus their time and attention on building interesting worlds, building interesting NPCs, building interesting scenarios, and weaving interesting adventures. Those creative endeavors are the most important part of DMing. And every minute a dungeon master spends having to tweak encounter balance, fix a broken monster stat block, try to account for balance issues between player characters, cleaning up the game rules, that is time taken away from the dungeon master's ability to be creative. One thing that we have noticed just coming off of our first Kickstarter was I would like to see uh, an expansion on the OGL. For those who don't know what the OGL is, it's the open game license. And if you are planning to publish your own adventure or your own material that is part of the Dungeons and Dragons universe, the OGL is the list of things that you are allowed to reference and allowed to use, 
but anything that isn't on that list, you're not allowed to use. There were entire adventures and characters, and we wish that we could tell people what spells they should use for all of their character options, but we weren't able to do so. Even something like Hex, we aren't allowed to mention it or put it on any of our monster stat blocks. I would like to see more robust rules for playing a character with a mixed ancestry. And for this reason, I do sort of feel like we should move past some of the language and go with ancestry as the term that we're using in our character origin process. Not the least of which is that I think that you could then tell new players, don't forget your ABCs, ancestry, background, and class. And you'd have the ABCs of character creation. I think it's perfect. You can have that one for free, uh, Watsi. Uh, ABC, character creation, ancestry, background, class, perfect. And they used the orc stat block uh, and not the drow, but they just described their character yeah. a certain way. But I think it would be really cool if you could grab and piece together. Like They say your age is somewhere in between, but yeah. I think it would be cooler to grab and pick which pieces from which yeah. ancestry you want to use. I do think that that would be awesome. I'm on the, the side of more tools, more customization, more options more ways of giving mechanical support because I do think that reflavoring can only take you so far. Yeah. And so players want more tools to customize their characters. You can never go wrong with giving more options, especially when it comes to character creation, in my opinion. There was a very early playtest draft of D&D Next where there was an ability score increase granted by your class. And... I, I'm pretty sure Pathfinder 2nd Edition does this, where you get an ability score increase from your class, from your background, and from your ancestry. I gotta say, that's really slick. I like, I like that idea. What if when you said, okay, I'm gonna play a fighter, so now you get to choose as a fighter, do you want a plus two bonus to your strength or constitution? And then you can get that other plus one from either your ancestry or your background. I do agree with you. Now, my only argument is you said constitution and strength for the fighter, and I would argue uh, strength and dexterity for the fighter. Okay, I'll, I'll concede on that one. But uh, <laughs> I, I do think that that's a really powerful option of saying, like, you get a plus two bonus from your class, you get a plus one bonus from your ancestry, and you get a plus one bonus from your background. Based on what you're choosing, you get a couple options, but that really means by the time you pick all three of those options, you kind of get to put your plus two and plus one in the places you would want them to go anyway. I think that you could really, really customize that, and I, I think that's a really smart way to go. Critical damage, that's fun. So instead of taking that away, let's pad the hit points on the monsters or whatever we need to do to make the balance happen somewhere else, because I, I just think it's fun for players to crit like this. And yeah. this whole game is about having yeah. fun, and there's nothing more fun than rolling a bunch of dice, and that's what a critical hit to me has always been. Yeah, it, it needs to feel weighty, it needs to feel significant, just make the crits double damage, whatever it is, and it's easy math, just times to it, and let's sort the balance out from that assumption rather than trying to dial things back a little bit. The final interesting thing that I love is the codification of the sources of magic back into arcane, divine, and primal. It's a subtle world building thing, but I like saying that, yes, this is arcane magic, this is divine magic, this is primal magic. Is actually really beautiful. We could even in future books add in new sources like psionic magic or occult magic.